Hey everyone, it's Ken Rakowski. Welcome to Metal Connect. Every week we feature one of the great speakers that joined us for Metal and we dive deep into their career and things that they've done to where we can learn from them so it can help us become better at what we are. This week is one of my most favorite people in the entire universe. Um, she is one of the most inspirational individuals because she walks the walk and talks the talk. She does, there's no BS about her whatsoever. She has managed to do the seven summits. That's the highest peaks in each continent, which is pretty amazing. Mount Everest won in 1.99, yeah, 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 almost twice, almost. We'll explain that. She speaks around the world. She's got some of the highest scores when it comes to professional speaking, meaning when she speaks at an event, the organizers and the event themselves generally rate the speakers, and she generally scores within the top 1%. That's incredible. She generally travels the world. She's speaking probably, I would say, 150 times a year. And uh, she uh, works with companies to help them engage their dreams to take to another level. I'm honored to have her join us. Allison Levine is with us right now. Hi, Allison. Hi, pleasure to be here. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for, thanks for everyone joining in tonight. Oh, yeah, we'll have a lot of fun people. Allison, that has been your backdrop for the last couple of months. Yep. It's not fake. <laughs> it's no, real. It's real. If you would guesstimate, if you had Dubai, everything behind you. Oh, God. How much do you think all that equipment would cost? Oh, my God. I don't even know. Um, a lot. It's just, this is probably all, you know, all the equipment I've had for years and years and years from my Everest, exp you know, all my mountaineering expeditions. And also I did, um, I skied to both the North and the South Pole. So that's called completing the Adventure Grand Slam when you climb the seven summits and ski to both the North and the South Pole. So I think there's like 20 people in the world who've completed the Adventure Grand Slam now. But so some of that equipment is um, polar stuff as well as mountaineering stuff and uh, never know when it's time to dust it off and use it again. So, yeah. Are you done with the cold? No, I don't think I'm done with the cold. Um, <laughs> I, you know, they say there's, there's no bad weather, only bad, you know, bad clothing or bad equipment. So if you're prepared for it and you have the right gear, it doesn't seem that bad. That's what they say. But I actually disagree because I'll tell you ski, like spending two months in Antarctica skiing every day, you know, en route to the South Pole, like it still feels really cold and uncomfortable. So that whole thing is bullshit about like, there's no bad weather. It's just bad gear, bad clothing. It's not yeah, bad. Let's, let's, bad let's step back. Uh, you, you're growing up where? Where are you from originally? Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona, which by the way, we just there two weeks ago, it's completely opened up. It's as yeah. if nothing happened, which is kind of mind blowing, right? Yeah. You, I, yeah. I just read today though, they've had a big like resurgence of COVID-19 cases there, but Phoenix is kind of a, yeah, it's a unique place. Um, I'm so, glad you went last week and not in August because it's- I kind of want to try it out, but that's a different story. I like heat. I love heat, but you're growing up in Phoenix. What, yeah. when you were younger, what did you aspire to be? What did you imagine yourself would be when you were at this age? So growing up in Phoenix, I aspired to be an air conditioning repair woman because- oh I just thought I was like, like two big reasons, like, you know, high demand and job security. Okay. So Fair I enough. just figured if I could fix air conditioning, cause ours would go out all the time. And it, sometimes it was a couple days before somebody could get out and repair it. So I just wanted to go into air conditioning repairing. Cause I just thought there will always be a need for me if I'm in this job and the high job security. So HVAC, I get it. And it makes sense. Where was the detour? All right, so because it was so damn hot in Phoenix all the time, I would, when I was younger, I would read books and watch documentary films about the early Arctic and Antarctic explorers and the early mountaineers. And I was just always drawn to those stories because it was an escape from the, the August heat in Phoenix. But I never thought I would actually go to those places because of um, some health challenges that I had. So when I was growing up, from the time I was a young kid, I would have um, just trouble breathing. I felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest. And it turns out I was, I was born with a hole in my heart, but it didn't get diagnosed right away because I grew up in this very tough love family. So when I would say to my parents, um, oh, you know, I feel like there's an elephant on my chest. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I feel like I'm going to pass out. My mom would say, oh, you're fine. You're probably just nervous for your 
piano recital. And I was like, mom, I don't think that's it. And she would say, well, how, how do you know? I'm like, because I don't take piano lessons. Like <laughs> I took guitar lessons. So she'd say, oh, you know what? Uh, just go down the street and we have a new neighbor, Dr. Clark. He has an excellent reputation. I hear he's a very good doctor. Why don't you just knock on his door and tell him what's wrong and, you know, maybe he can help you. Like my parents never took us to doctors. So I walk down the street, I knock on the door of our new neighbor and I'm like, hi, are you, are you Dr. Clark? Oh yeah, my, my name's Allison. And my mom said, you're a doctor and I'm having some problems breathing and my heart feels weird. And he's like, yeah, I'm a veterinarian. Shut up. So, yes. Come on. So, yeah. He's like, unless you want to get spayed or microchipped, <laughs> we probably can't help you. So, um, so these issues that I had got worse and worse. And eventually when I was 17 years old, I lost consciousness. And the friends that I was with at the time had the good sense to rush me to the emergency room where I was diagnosed with this hole in my heart. So, um, I didn't get diagnosed until later in life, even though I was born with this problem, because my parents just, I grew up in this tough love family of no whining, no complaining, you're fine, just power through it. So I had my first heart surgery when I turned 17. That one didn't work. I had another one when I turned 30, and, and I'm 54 I'm serious, now. when was the heart surgery? I mean, this is something a long, long surgical time, long healing with something like that, or is it something that was in no, and out? It, well, it was an eight hour procedure where they put these catheters in through my jugular vein, in through my um, wrists and up through my groin. And they tried to like cut off this hole that was in my heart. They tried to like cauterize it, but they couldn't get close enough to it when they first tried it because it was really close to what's called the AV node in my heart. And they were afraid they would sever the AV node. So they weren't able to fix it. But by the time I turned 30, you know, 13 years later, medical technology had progressed to the point where they could fix it. And the doctor who was the, like the pioneer of this procedure was at UCSF. So I went to UCSF and this really famous heart surgeon was able to actually go in and seal up the hole in my heart that was causing these problems. So um, I had like a checkup about 12 months later at my 12 month, 12 month check. They were like, you're fine, everything's good. And so at that point, that's when the light bulb went on in my head. And I thought, if I want to know what it's like to be these explorers going to these remote mountain ranges, and I should go to the remote mountain ranges instead of just reading about them. If I want to know what it's like to ski across Antarctica, I should go to Antarctica instead of watching documentaries about it. And if these other guys can go do these things, then, you know, why can't I do them too? So I climbed my first mountain when I was 34 years old. Um, so that was 20 years ago, and well, that's how I got wait, started. Wait, 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 back, 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 truck. You had to get yeah. money to do these things. What were you doing in the, the that before 30s? What were you doing, 20 to 30? So um, I was working in the pharmaceutical and medical device industry, and I had lived and worked in Southeast Asia, and so I had a lot of frequent flyer miles, mm. and I didn't start climbing until I so I. I started grad school. Like I got into grad school, I got into business school and um, I quit my job two months before I started grad school. And so that was the first time I had time to travel. And I had all these frequent flyer miles from working in Asia. So I used my miles and every time I had a break from grad school, which was every six weeks, um, I had a week off. And so I'd use my frequent flyer miles because I was living off of student loans. So I didn't have money, but I'd use my miles and I'd go to a different mountain every time I had a break from school and I would just throw everything I needed in a backpack, right? Sleeping bag, tent, camping stove, freeze dry food. And I would go to these different places and I would meet people on every mountain. I would meet other groups. And usually if you're by yourself, there people are really cool. And they'll say like, oh, you're by yourself. Like come join us, come have dinner with our team or come climb with us. And so I would get invited to climb with other teams. And I would meet people that were much more experienced and much more skilled than I was. And but you I didn't have any classical mountain training, did you? Did you? No, I just, I learned, I learned from other people that I met on the trail. So when I went to Kilimanjaro, that's not a technical peak. You just have to be able to put one foot in front of the other. You don't need any special skill or special training. So I went on that trip. And when I was on that trip, I actually met some really experienced mountain guides. And those are the people that kind of helped advise me going forward and gave me advice on what to try next. And each mountain I, I went to was a little bit harder and a little bit harder. So I built up my skills slowly and would just ask people if I could climb with them and I would 
climb alongside them or behind them, people that were better and stronger and faster. And I would learn from those people. And then eventually like the first expensive mountain I went to was Mount Everest, but I got sponsorship for that. So wait, wait that was your um, first big one. Well, the first oh. like really, really hard one, like Mount McK the first really expensive one. So it wasn't my first big mountain, but it was my first expensive mountain. So it was $25,000 a person. Like anything I climbed before that was a couple hundred bucks. So it wasn't a big deal. Mountain McKinley in Alaska was only a couple hundred bucks. Um, at the time, I think the permits, no, that was more expensive. I think the permits for McKinley were, I don't know, maybe a thousand or so, but not really expensive. But, but, okay, maybe because it's so Oh, no, I think they're $800. It's, it's so $800. alien to almost anyone that's watching this. Maybe there are some mountaineers in here. Yeah. When you go pick a summit that you want to go after, so yeah. what was your first big mountain? Well, Kilimanjaro was the first mountain I went to, and it's tall in that it's over 19,000 feet, but I had plans to go there with two girlfriends. But I know so go. walk that. I know a lot of people have done that. Yeah, you could just walk up that one. Yeah, you can, yeah. and then and yeah. you get up there and you right. You still right. feel the altitude. You Altitude's still really feel the altitude, yeah. no question. Yeah, but what would be more of a technical one? What was your first more technical one then? Um, Rainier. So Mount Rainier sounds like it would be really easy because it's easy to go to. You go to Seattle, it's right there. It's not hard to get to. It's not that high. It's just a little over 14,000 feet. That mountain is an ass kicker. It is really, really hard. And that was, I mean, you're carrying a heavy pack. So I weigh 110 pounds. For me to put on a 50 or 60 pound pack is really, really hard. Every step uphill for me is really hard. So that was probably the hardest one I did before like going to Mount McKinley that was really hard um I did that in 2000 right after I graduated from uh right after I finished graduate school how long does it take you to do Mount Rainier a couple days and then Mount McKinley uh it depends I I think you can do it if you have perfect luck with weather you can do it in 10 days to two weeks but I would say that most trips go a little bit longer. I'd say closer to three weeks, 17 days to three weeks. And what's in Asiana? What would it be down in Australia and New Zealand? There's like nothing down there, right? Yeah. Well, there's this mountain called Karsten's Pyramid, which is like the only mountain where I felt like I really almost died on a mountain was Karsten's Pyramid. And I wrote, I wrote about that story in my book, which is called On the Edge. I'll show you guys. If you want to, um, this is my book, On the Edge. But, um, uh, that's actually a picture of me on Mount McKinley, by the way. That is, it's not an illustration. That's a photo of me climbing Mount McKinley. Wow. Um, but uh, Karsten's Pyramid is this, it's a little over 16,000 feet. It's in this area called Irian Jaya. And uh, I was climbing by myself and I, my headlamp burned out. So I had an extra battery for my headlamp. That didn't help me because the bulb burned out. And it was nighttime by the time I was coming down. So it was pitch black, I couldn't see anything. So I'm on my butt scooting along this really narrow ridge because I can't see. So I'm on my butt trying to, with my hands behind me, my feet in front of me, feeling with my hands and my feet where the ridge is so I didn't step off it and die. It was so scary, it took me so long. I think it took me 19 hours. It should have only taken eight or nine hours, but it took me 19 hours because my headlamp burned down, I couldn't see. I literally couldn't see to put one foot in front of me, so I couldn't take a step. So I ripped the whole ass out of my Gore-Tex pants because I was sliding along this ridge, this rocky, really sharp ridge. So I ripped the whole ass out of the pants. And I was so bummed because they're expensive, right? And I'm in, I just finished grad school. I don't have a, you know, I haven't started my job or anything. So I'm still a broke student. So I go to the North Face. I walk into the North Face because they have a, a lifetime warranty against manufacturers' defects. So I walk in and the whole ass is ripped out of these pants and they're covered in mud and really dirty. And I walk in and I was like, hi, um, I need to exchange these pants because there's a hole in them. And the guy was like, well, let me see them. You know, and I pull them out of the bag and the whole ass is ripped out of the back of them. He's like, what happened to these pants? And I go, oh, well, clearly like there's, there's a hole in them. So can you exchange them? Cause I know you have a lifetime warranty. And he goes, um, we have a warranty against manufacturer defects. He goes, this looks like a man-made defect. And I go, 
it for sure was not a man-made defect. He's like, I think it was. I'm like, no, it was woman-made. And he just started laughing and he thought it was so funny. And he held up the pants. He's like, holy shit. He's like, I can't believe these are our pants. Like they were unrecognizable because the whole back was shredded. And he goes, I'll give you a new pair if you let us keep these pants because we'll hang them on the wall. I was like, deal. So, um, so I got a new pair of Gore-Tex pants. They're like $275, but at the time that was so much money to me, right? I was a broke student and I was like, I was so happy. And I bought them at a, I bought the pants at a secondhand store <laughs> called Second Ascent in Seattle. So I think they cost me like 30 bucks, but they were expensive to buy. So I got a new pair. So I was really excited about that. <laughs> so every time you finish and while you're descending, do you yeah. Of the next one as you're actually coming down going all right i did this do you have the next summit in mind no when i'm coming down usually i'm like i am never ever going to do something like like this again ever and, and sometimes i'll write myself a note i'm like i need to write it down so that i follow my advice next time do not fucking ever like do this again and then sure enough, you forget all the pain and the misery so quickly after, and then you're doing it again. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's now, of course, talk about Everest because the first Everest. So, Allison, I saw you, of course, on that TED Talk where you, I think many people discovered you at that TED Talk. That TED Talk was oh. amazing because you talked about the acceleration and exhilaration of life, but dying at the same time. You are dying at a certain point. Can you tell us? Yes. Because I think a few of us have probably been to 16, 17, maybe 19,000 feet, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, but once you hit a certain that's point, like you start dying. Yeah. So that's real altitude, by the way, 16, 17, 19,000 feet. That's real altitude. You feel it. But when you go to Mount Everest or any other 8,000 meter peak, so 8,000 meters is about 26,000 feet. I know you guys can all do the math, but just to save you the time. It's about 26,000 feet. And there's 14 mountains in the world that are over 8,000 meters. And once you get above 26,000 feet, 8,000 meters, you're in what's known as the death zone. And they call it the death zone because your body is literally starting to die at that elevation. Your muscles are getting weaker. Your body is starting to deteriorate. Your body starts to pull all the blood out of your fingers and toes, out of your hands and your feet. And it pools all the blood in your core because your body, the way it functions is, is brilliant. It knows you don't, you don't need these to live, but you need your heart, your lungs, you know, so it focuses all of its effort on keeping those organs alive. So you're constantly, you know, wiggling your hands and your toes and your hands and your feet to make sure that you don't get frostbite. And at that elevation, it's also really hard to breathe. So you have to take about five to 10 breaths for one step, five to 10 breaths for one step. So you might think the summit's only a couple hundred feet away from me right now, but that's going to take hours. It's going to take you hours to go that far. Jeez. So can you kind of just give me an, an idea of what that means? Well, every step. Every so, step. Yeah. so for example, when I, I was the team captain for the first American Women's Everest Expedition, we got to within, we were less than 300 feet from the summit of Mount Everest. And we turned around in bad weather. We turned around in a storm because we didn't feel like we had enough time to get to the summit. And people, they look at the picture of where we were, where we turned around and they think, why, why didn't you just like run and touch the top and, and run back? And but you can't run at that elevation because you're taking 10 breaths for every step. So a couple hundred feet takes several hours. And so what you have to keep in mind is it's, it's really easy to think, okay, well, can I just go for a couple of hours? Yes, I feel like I could keep going for a couple of hours. But what you have to remember is that the summit is only the halfway point. It's never the goal. It's only your halfway point. You have to be able to get yourself to the summit and back down safely. So it's not a question of, do I have two or three hours left in me where I could keep going, you know, where I could go for two or three hours, get to the top. Do you have another six hours in you to get yourself back down? So that's the question you have to be able to answer. And that's why most of the deaths that occur on Mount Everest occur after people have reached the summit, right? Because oh. they use everything they have in them to get themselves to the top and they do not have enough, enough gas left in the tank to get themselves back down. Besides uh, your, 
mountain in New Zealand or that area down there? Yeah, Karstens Grove. Where you Kevin. felt like you were going to die. Yeah. Did you have that experience when you were doing Everest? Um, you know what? It, it wasn't so much that I felt like I was going to die. It was just that, well, yeah. Okay, so I will say one time on the descent, coming back, um, I'll show you guys this picture. Coming back through this area called the Kumbu Icefall. So this is the Kumbu Icefall. It's these, like this area with all these big, huge moving ice chunks and these big open crevasses and these ladders. And we were coming through the Kumbu Icefall and there was an avalanche in the icefall that tore right through the icefall and took out a bunch of ladders. And I was 100% sure that we were gonna get killed. I mean, cause it was coming right toward us and it stopped about five feet away from us. So that was one time where I thought I could get, I was going to get killed. But the main thing for me too, wasn't on the second, my second Everest expedition in 2010, it wasn't so much feeling like I was going to die. It was just feeling like I wasn't going to be fast enough or I wasn't going to be strong enough. And I, it, like, I would get psyched out because I would look at these guys on the mountain that were six foot four, 230 pounds, right? Twice my weight, a foot taller than me. And they could carry a heavy pack a lot more efficiently than I could. And so that was like, man, I'm not gonna be fast enough. I'm not gonna be strong enough. Um, but I realized you don't, you don't have to be the, the fastest. You don't have to be the strongest. You just have to keep going, right? You just put one foot in front of the other. And the other thing that really helped me a lot on my second trip was um, when I got to, on my second trip, when I got to the point where I had turned around eight years prior, where we turned around in bad weather eight years prior, there was this other guy in the mountain and he was climbing a pretty far ahead of me. And so as I started to approach the South summit, which is our, where we turned around in 2002, I see this guy and he's standing there at the South summit and he should have been way ahead of that because he started out a lot earlier than I did. And he's standing at the South summit and I'm approaching and he starts yelling. And he's like, Hey, Allison. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, Who, who's, yelling at me right now, right? Like, I'm like, I have no time to talk to people. Like I'm focused, I'm focused, I'm looking at the ground. Like I'm looking at this ridge. I'm on this, this summit ridge that has a 10,000 foot drop on one side and an 8,000 foot drop on the other. And here's someone that's trying to talk to me. And I'm like, what? He's like, hey, Allison. And I was like, what? Like, what do you want? And he goes, I need you to promise me something. And I was like, what the hell? Like, what do you want? And he goes, I need, and he, we're yelling, right? He's like, cause it's, it's so windy and the weather's bad. He goes, I need you to promise me that you're going to go further than this. And like, this was the South summit. This, what he was talking about was the point where I had turned around eight years earlier and he waited at that point for me just to like, give me that encouragement. And I couldn't even talk. So I was getting all choked up, like fogging up my goggles, like, and I just, like, I couldn't even talk, but I just, like, held out my hand, and we just, like, shook on it. That's awesome. Like, I'm going. Like, I'm going to go. And just knowing that somebody was cheering for me, like, I'm in my own head, right? In my own, like, fear and pain and discomfort. And just knowing that there was someone out there that cared about the state I was in and what I was thinking about and whether I was going to make it or not. Like, somebody that, that was cheering for me. That's that, powerful. It was really powerful for me. I was like no, I'm not turning around now. Like I'm going, like, I'm going to keep going. And just, it was, it really meant a lot. It, it, and that's where I learned that there's a lot of power in a few kind words, a few kind words of encouragement to somebody who's struggling or experiencing some self-doubt or fear can completely change the outcome of a situation. Because just when he said that to me at the South Summit, I was like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to do this. And before I caught up with him at, with every step, I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. So um, it was just really, it reminds me now, like to really look around and sometimes people don't look like they're struggling, but inside there's turmoil, right? Sure. So even the best, strongest climbers can have a bad day on the mountain. Even the best, strongest climbers. Well, that's horrible. Have you don't want a bad day. No. No, but no. you have your days of, of feeling self-doubt and feeling like, forget it. Like, I'm just, it's going to be so much easier to just turn around because when you turn around and you go down, everything's easier. You can breathe more easily as you're going down. It, every step you take uphill hurts more and more. It hurts your lungs more and more. Your headache gets worse. You're feeling sick to your stomach. You feel like you're going to puke. That 
feeling intensifies with every step, but you know that every step you take downward is going to alleviate that pain. So it's really easy to just be like, screw it, I'm going down. That's awesome. But so to have someone cheering for you, it, I feel like it makes the pain more tolerable because you know you're not going through it by yourself. It's somebody else is going through it with you. Allison Levine's joining us, guys. And if you got a question, put it right, right in there in the chat and I'll unmute you. I want you to ask her questions because this opportunity to share time with somebody that's done incredible things, she's truly an inspiration. She's amazing. And uh, she's based in the NorCal area. So she lives in the San Francisco area. It's great to have her here. Allison, you have become one of the top speakers in the world. You've traveled the world speaking. How do you turn your talks of climbing all these incredible mountains and skiing the, pole, the polar caps, how do you turn that into a talk that corporations want to hear? Well, first of all, what you have to remember is that it's never about you. It's got to be about them, right? And nobody, I, I remember when I was in corporate America and we'd have these speakers come in and maybe they were an Olympian or something and they would come in and they would talk about from the time they were four years old, they were super focused and their whole family, you know, they sacrificed and they moved to the Olympic training center so they could focus all their energy on this. And I'm thinking, well, good for you that you had that experience, but I want to hang myself in my cube every day. So how does this help me? Like knowing how elite, what an elite athlete you were and how focused you were and how your whole family sacrificed for you. Like most of us aren't in that situation. Most of us have to work and most of us have the families that have their own responsibilities and their own things that they're focused on. And very few people are going to be in a situation to to really focus their life 100% on something. And so for me, it was more like, I just figured I need to be, I need this to be relatable. And I need for people in the audience to feel like this applies to them and not sit there and go, well, that's never gonna be, because most of the people in the audience, they'll never climb Mount Everest. They'll never spend two months skiing across Antarctica, but they do know what it feels like to have to deal with a changing environment, to have their plan completely demolished and have to start from scratch, to have to backtrack, right? And come, come back to your starting point and start all over again and feel like your progress was completely wiped out. You know, they know what it feels like to have to deal with these environments that are constantly shifting and changing, where whatever plan you came up with is out, outdated as soon as it's finished. They, they know what it feels like to have the fear of the unknown in front of them. Um, they know what it's like to have to put together a team that can function under very stressful situations. So what I tell myself before I go on stage is I think about who is this audience? What, what's important to them? Forget what's important to me. What's important to them? And I, what I keep in mind too is that time is our most valuable resource. And these people in this audience are giving me an hour of their time or whatever it is, 45 minutes, whatever amount of time I'm on stage. I better damn well deliver something that's going to make them feel glad that they spent that hour with me or that 45 minutes with me because they're never going to get that hour back. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want them shocked, to by the way, when someone started saying, oh, yeah, we'll pay you 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars for that time. Does that blow your mind that that's what they're willing totally. to pay you? Yeah, it totally blows my mind. But I, it, it, but I just know I have to deliver because they're never going to get that hour back. So my goal, I, I want them to walk out and say, there's nowhere else I would have rather been than in that room listening to that story. And for me, it's just an honor that people are giving me their time. For me, it's an honor that you guys on this Zoom call are giving me your time. You have a million other things you could be doing than sitting here and listening to Alice and Levine. Like, so I feel like it's such an honor to be here on oh, this call with you. Right, we are honored. No, no, seriously. And like, you know, we all learn from each other. So I just try to keep in mind, you know, trying to position yourself as some kind of elite athlete, whatever. Like, so that's why I tell people, you don't, it's not about being the best and the fastest. It's about just being relentless about putting one foot in front of the other because everybody can do that. And also everybody can relate to failures, right? I mean, we had this really public failure as the first American women's ever sex expedition and we didn't make it. And we came within 300 feet, but we got back and then we were the butt of Jay Leno's opening monologue joke. And, 
you know, doing, they had to do this media tour and everyone's just like, oh, you guys, like you didn't make it. You must feel terrible. And how does that feel? I'm like, well, super shitty. Like, how do you think it feels? I mean, <laughs> duh. So um, I, like, I just, you know, point out to people, like one thing I really want people to remember is Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, right? The maybe the most famous Everest climbers because they were the first guys to summit Mount Everest in 1953, right? They got all the fame, all the recognition, but there were dozens of climbers who tried and failed before those two made it to the summit. But those two, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, those guys had all the benefit of all the 411, all the data, all the research, all the information from those previous climbers. And granted, the earlier climbers, they never became famous, they didn't get the recognition, they didn't become household names. But if those guys hadn't had the guts to try it first, then I bet Stredman, Hillary, and Tenzing Norgay would never have made it. So I like to talk a lot about failure because the way you have to look at failure is number one, failure is one thing that happens to you at one point in time. It does not define you. And the other thing is when you have a big failure, you have to congratulate yourself, right? And appreciate it because your actions having gone through that process, you never know who's going to be following in your footsteps down the road, like Stroman, Hillary, and Tinson Norgay. You don't know who's going to be following in your footsteps down the road who will go on to achieve really great things because of your past experience, even if you didn't have the outcome that you wanted at the time. So I think, you know, the reason people can relate to my talks is because it's not all about like, let me tell you how dedicated I was and how focused I was and how hard I trained and how fast I was and how strong I was and how proud I was when I stood on top of the highest mountain in the world. Have you guys done that? No? Oh, poor you. You know, that's just, I don't, no one wants to listen to speakers like that. Nobody does. God, no, but I'll tell you, sitting in, uh, I went to Annapura, which is nothing like what you did. Right, but going there and going, this is nothing compared to what you did. I was there looking and admiring what you did. By the way, Nepal's Nepal's like one of my favorite places. I love Nepal. You must love it too, right? I do love it. I it's really a magical place. It's so amazing. And the Sherpa people who are there so Sherpas, by the way, people think Sherpa means carrying things up a mountain, but Sherpas are actually an ethnic and uh, minority group in Nepal. There's so there's Sherpas that are lawyers and farmers and doctors and, you know, yeah. everything else in between. But the Sherpa people have just this like aura about them, just this kindness and this pleasantness and they're always smiling no matter what. And I feel like no matter what goes on, they just have this positive outlook. So I really try to emulate that as much as I can because um, we, we have these things in our brains called mirror neurons and these mirror neurons mimic like the emotions of people around you so that's when they say enthusiasm is contagious that saying is a real thing because your emotions actually are spread to the people around you and science shows that happier people and happy when teams are happier they perform at a higher level and so if you can be a positive person with a good attitude and a sense of humor and be the person to put the smile on your face when things are really, really challenging, like that does actually hold value and that actually does help your team. And so I, you know, I think about that when I go to Nepal too, how the Sherpas are always smiling, always have a, always. you know, a sunny disposition. And I think, look, when, when things are super shitty, like you have to acknowledge that and you have to, you know, that's fine. But I think that, when everyone's down, if you can be that person to try to boost everybody's spirits. And I feel like every time I go to Nepal, like my spirits are very much boosted by just being around the local people there. It's awesome. And by the way, the Mountaineer Museum, I forget what it's called. It's like the nicest building in the entire country. It, it's their salute to the people that have climbed Everest. Yeah. It's amazing. Hey, let's yeah. take some questions, guys. Let's first go to Gino. Gino, what is your question for Allison? Hey, Allison. Uh, I just want to say it's an honor actually to have you here speaking with us. Uh, I kind of jumped on a little late, so I don't know if this was said or spoken of, but I just okay. wanted to know how you prepare for an Everest climb. Like, like the, how okay. do you, like breathing techniques and et cetera, et cetera. All right. So I realize this advice is going to be a little controversial uh, because I wrote about this in my book and it's probably the only chapter where people come to me and they're like, this doesn't really sound like a good idea. Um, 
but I'll, I'll explain it. So the only way to properly prepare for an Everest expedition or any big mountain is to get out to the mountains. No amount of running, swimming, cycling is going to help you prepare. That's going to help your cardiovascular system, but it's not going to prepare you to climb a big mountain. So you have to go to the mountains. You have to get out and simulate exactly what you're going to be doing. So for me, I would go up to Mount Shasta, which is about five hour drive from where I live in the Bay Area. So I would, I would go to Mount Shasta because it's over 14,000 feet. So some decent elevation and I'd walk uphill in my crampons with my ice axe and a pack to train, you know, train for the uphill, train for the altitude as much as I could in California. But also I would start from the parking lot at 11 o'clock at night and I would climb from the parking lot to the summit with a heavy pack with no sleep. And with a heavy pack, it would take me 18, 19 hours because part of my training was practicing sleep deprivation. Mm. Because when you're on a big mountain, your summit day might be 18, 20, 24 or more hours. So I wanted to practice really exerting, you know, my body, like putting it into an extreme situation of exhaustion and have to climb, like perform at a high level with no sleep. So I practiced by going to the mountains and by not sleeping. Now, is it good for you to go without sleep a bunch of times? No, it is terrible for you. But I didn't write a book about how to live to be 100. <laughs> I, I wrote a book about how to get through the toughest of times when you absolutely have to. So for me, that's just part of it is it's not just going to the mountains, but it's actually practicing sleep deprivation. Now, look, we all know that uh, sleep deprivation, it, it is not good for you. So I don't recommend it unless you have to do it because you know, they're, they're tying sleep deprivation to all kinds of disease now and, you know, higher risk of cancer, all these terrible things. So um, I don't really advise so don't that. Listen to you. Sure. Don't listen to Allison on this one. <laughs> exactly. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to John Livesey. John. Hey, oh Allison. Gosh, seriously? Hey. Yes, I wouldn't oh. miss an opportunity to hear you. Hi. <laughs> I think that story, yes, likewise. I think that story of your parents sending you to a vet for your heart is it started your love of dogs. Oh, probably, yeah. Good time. <laughs> but you know, you did so much preparation for climbing these mountains and you really are so great at putting yourself in the shoes of the audience. I'm, yeah. um, my question is how much customization do you do for each audience you speak to? Yeah, so for each audience, I you know, Google search like crazy, like the company, you know, go to their website, read all the press releases, and then Google search like crazy for the, the industry and the company and the competition. So I can have an understanding of what their challenges might be now. So that's what I get externally. And then I'll do a conference call with the client to talk to them. And I'll ask them, what do you want this audience to walk away with? When they walk out of the room, like, give me three things or five things. Like, what do you want them to walk away with when they leave here? And so it's, it varies based on what each, um, sure. what each client wants. Oh, wait, I have a, there's a question. There was one about something teaching at the challenge teaching at West Point. What's the most challenging situation you face teaching class at West Point? Oh God. All right. So, um, wait, I, wait, 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 Allison. Oh, yeah. I, I noticed that, uh, your ADD just kicked in. <laughs> let's, let's do the questions oh. in order. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> because first, did you finish John's? Okay. John, yeah, that was amazing. You picked you know. the most important question. Yeah, well, I'm going to get to you, Gary, because <laughs> your, your, your backyard is Mount Rainier. She's climbed it. She's oh, yeah. your backyard. Now I have to say I've never climbed it. I know you haven't, but Mount Hood, right? Don't you take the girls up all the time? Yeah, we do some hike. I, I hike a lot, but not Yeah. That. So let, let's hang on. Wait, Gary. I want to go to Steve first. Who, uh, Steve, I know you're holding the baby. Are you still there? I am. Hello. All right. Oh go, my gosh, look at and that. Little Julie. <laughs> so, Steve, what's your question? Um, I, I was just thinking about, you know, what techniques you would use to, to try and unblock physical or mental challenges, whether that be climbing a mountain or doing a presentation, like maybe some of the common, you know, uh, techniques you would use to, to achieve both. Um, okay, well, for... There's actually, I'll tell you what it is, is, is really the same for both, is feeling like people are counting on me, right? And just knowing like, I'm going to deliver because I know people are counting on me and I do not want to let them down. And 
I have a chapter in my book that talks about like, you should have three words or maybe it's five words, however, you should have these words, a catchphrase that describes you, that you want people to know like what's important to you. And so for me, my three words are count on me. Those are my three words that define me. I want people to know that when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. When I promise you something, I'm going to follow through. Like I'm, and so whether it's climbing a mountain with a team, you know, that like, I want people to count on me. I want to be the MVP on every team. Cause I, I know I'm not going to be the fastest and I know I'm not going to be the strongest, but it doesn't mean that I can't add value. And so I want, I always want people to feel like they're glad I was part of the team. So that's what keeps me going on these trips is just feeling like I owe it to my teammates to keep going when things get tough, to put a smile in my face when, you know, when things look kind of bleak, to tell the stupid, ridiculous, corny jokes when people need a boost and need a lift. So that's just what I want. I want to be known as that person that people can count on. And it's the same thing when I'm giving a speech. I want for the person who booked me to feel like they were glad that they booked me and not say like, oh God, like, you know, that was, that was a disaster. I want them to say, I'm so glad that I booked her. And a lot of times I get booked for speeches, believe it or not, where people are like, you're the first woman in the 30 year history of this conference. Like we've never had a female speaker before. So I always love hearing that, but um, I just, you know, again, it's just feeling like people are giving me their time and they're, when I get to join a team on a mountain, when someone invites me to be part of an expedition, I feel so honored. They're inviting me to be part of this team and they're putting their faith in me. So I owe it to them to give them everything. And when I feel like quitting on a mountain, I know I have this voice in my head that says like, get your shit together and just put one foot in front of the other because you can keep going because you felt like this before and you kept going then. So you can keep going now. I mean, we can always put, take one more step. And that's all getting to the top of a mountain is. It's just one step. It's one step like a gazillion times, but that's all it is, is just one more step. So if you can take one more step, you're like, all right, I just took one more step. All right, I bet I could take one more. All right, now I can take one more and then eventually you'll, you'll get to the summit. And so you know, whether I'm giving a speech or on a, a mountain, I just keep thinking, this isn't about me. It's not about how crappy I feel or how tired I feel or how sick to my stomach I feel. This is about my team. So I'm going to, or this is about the audience. So no matter what I'm feeling, I'm going to put a smile on my face and get out there and do what I'm supposed to do. So I've had over 600 speakers at Metal, 600. And I think you're in the top five of what people say. And, I'm, oh, so nice. talking about, and they're prolific. I mean, you know, John Paul DeJoria, who was homeless at the age of 55, living yeah. in his car, and he's a multi-billionaire. You're within the top five. And I'm not saying that to make you feel good. I'm saying that because... I'm oh, honest. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's really nice of you. Thank Let's go to Gary Sher. Gary, now you can ask your question. Yes. So, Allison, uh, and you already read ahead, so you know kind of the root of the question, but what I'm really trying to understand is, is it must be intimidating to be at West Point with just the, yeah. how smart the people are, the egos, how physical they are. And tell me it's not like Kelly McGillis in Top Gun. <laughs> Um, so part of, at first, what was so intimidating to me is that like most of the faculty there are like big time, like army officers and there's art, you know, retired army generals. And I'm thinking, what am I going to be able to offer versus these generals that have, you know, achieved all these things and reached these incredible levels in the military. And what the head of our, I taught in the department of behavioral sciences and leadership, general Kolditz was the head of the department. He's the guy that hired me. And he said, you know, these cadets, because when I meet an army general, I'm like, oh my God, like this guy's a general in the army, my God. Uh, he said, they hear from generals all the time. Like we put generals in front of them and they don't even blink. And he said, your background is so different that we feel like they will absorb these leadership lessons coming from you because you present them in such a different context. They hear military stories all day long, every day for four years, but they don't hear stories about like, how do you ski, you know, what, what happens when a team breaks down all the way to the South Pole, like when the team dynamics break down and how do you keep everybody together and how do you deal with poor performers, right? When you're in the middle of Antarctica and there's nowhere to go and you can't cut anybody loose, right? Because these cadets, they graduate, they're second lieutenants, they're platoon leaders. They didn't get to pick the people in their platoon, you know, but they have to lead them. And so, 
Um, they thought that the cadets would, they said they will enjoy hear, hearing from you because your stories will be so different. The other thing is that I found that a lot of the female cadets really appreciated hearing my stories also because I'm small. So I'm, you know, 5'4", about 110 pounds. And these young female cadets who are also small, they, are, they have a lot of anxiety about how it's going to be when they graduate and they've got to carry a 50 pound ruck alongside their, you know, fellow second lieutenants who are a foot taller than them and twice their weight. And so telling stories about how, um, you know, my, my size and my strength was never going to be my biggest asset. It was never, ever going to be where I could add value, but I figured out how to add value in different ways. And I think that was a powerful message for these young female cadets that knew that physical strength I mean, there's plenty of female cadets who are big, tall, strong, but not all of them are. And so um, those people are of value. They're going to add value in different ways. It's not going to be physical strength. It's going to be elsewhere. But I think that was um, valuable to them. But I, I mean, I still like, I get intimidated by like, oh my God, what are they, like, why are they going to want to listen to me compared to these army generals have had these amazing experiences. And so um, but apparently they, they just have so much exposure to military stories and military officers and generals that they like hearing stories from other people. What happens when you're traveling and speaking in countries where women are repressed? Uh, if you're in a country and you, you, you are a, you're one of the most powerful speakers out there, you're incredibly inspirational, and you see women that are, are held back. How do you feel about that? Well... I haven't, I would love to be invited to speak in some of those countries, but to date, I haven't been invited to speak mm. in any countries like that. Um, the only place I've even really gone where women are held back, and I, it wasn't for a speaking engagement, was Uganda. So I, I went to the, these mountains in Uganda that border Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, these mountains called the Ruanzori Mountains. And I um, discovered once I got there that women in that area had no rights. They were owned by men. They were actually owned by men. But I negotiated with the head of the park service and the head of the local village to train the very first group of local women to work in those mountains in Western Uganda. And so women prior to my work there in 2005, women had no way to earn money other than prostitution. And they were dying young. They were dying of AIDS left and right. And they would tell me, um, we love war. We pray for war because when there's war, there's soldiers. And when there's soldiers, that's the only way we can make money, right? As prostitutes. So, um, you know, and that was killing them. So I figured out the only way, right? If you want to improve the, the situation for people in those villages, like you've got to give women some earning power. So it wasn't as easy as I make it sound when I go like, yeah, I negotiated with the head of the village and took these women up into the mountains. Like it was a lot of negotiation, a lot of back and forth, a lot of heartache. Um, but I finally did get permission to train the first group of local women in Uganda to climb U Uganda's highest peak and, and I trained them to work as porters and trekking guides in those mountains. So it was the first time women could earn a sustainable living wage. Um, and then I, went, I go back every few years to train more and more women to work in those jobs. So wow. I try to change things, but there's a fine line, right, between respecting cultural norms and trying to improve things. Cause you don't want to walk in and be like, yeah, here comes this, you know, white chick that's going to stomp all over our cultural norms and thinks that her way is the right way. Like it's, it, it's a delicate balance to, you know, you want to help, but you want to be respectful. So you've got to find, you know, that, that happy medium. We got a couple more questions. We have you for a few more minutes. Let's go to Paul. Paul, what is your question for Allison? Paul? I'm on mute, Paul. Go for it. Thank you. Well, I'm just in awe of the courage it took for, to, for you to make these climbs. I mean, risking your life has obviously had an impact in giving you the passion that you have. So how do you achieve that level of passion without risking your life? Hi. So I always remind myself that the number one goal of any climb, the number one goal of not just any climb, of every climb, come back alive. Number one goal. Number two, come back with all your fingers and toes. Number three, come back as friends with the people that you're with. You know, maybe goal number four is, is reach the summit of the mountain. But I always tell myself like a summit is never worth 
risking your life or your well-being, right? Because the summit is just a pile of rock and ice. And that's what I remind myself all the time. The summit is a pile of rock and ice. Standing on top of a pile of rock and ice isn't going to change the world. So it's just not worth, you know, risking, taking that kind of risk. Now, I will tell you that I do feel fear, you know, on these big mountains. It's not like I just go and I don't feel fear. I do feel fear, but what I realize is that you can be scared and brave at the same time. And that's just what I have to remind myself, right? You can be scared and brave at the same time. I like that. Let's go to Jared. Jared, you got a whole slew of questions. Go for it. Jared. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, go for it. First question, it's both advice, but advice, well, first of all, thank you for doing this. Of course. Um, first question is advice to someone who wants to become a speaker to professionally and to contribute to the lives of others, practical applications, steps, how do you become a speaker, et cetera. Second question is advice on prepping for a climb uh, or to do something very physically challenged if you have had and currently have injuries. Yeah, so the speaking thing, uh, I Okay, I'm not trying to avoid this answer because there's just a lot to this answer. There's so much, it's, it's more complicated than people realize. It sounds so easy to just like, just write a speech and get on stage and give it. And I spoke at my, you know, my best friend's wedding. You know, I stood up and gave a toast at the rehearsal dinner and everyone said it was amazing. So I'd say the first thing is you have to have content. You have to have a message that's going to be helpful. What is the audience going to gain from listening to you? Oh, let me tell you how hard I worked and how dedicated I was and how focused I was. And then I became an Olympian and I won all these medals. Like, good for you, but that doesn't help anyone else. So I, so number one is you have to have a message that's gonna have some positive impact on the audience. Number two, you have to be able to deliver it in a compelling fashion. So we all know people that might have a good message, but they're not necessarily great on stage. And then there's people that are really good on stage, but their message isn't really that valuable. So you have to have both things. Um, you have to have a message. I feel like a message that helps people in some way. The talk cannot be about you. I have people that contact me all the time. They're like, hey, I did this ultra marathon. And I'd never done one before and I did an ultra marathon. So I want to like get paid to talk about that. I'm like, okay, that's awesome about the ultra marathon. What does the audience, what's going to, what's in it for them? them? What's, what's, in it for what's in it for them? Yeah. Um, so like just achieving something isn't enough. You have to have a message that's going to help the audience be better, do better, become more efficient, look at things differently, approach challenges differently, overcome obstacles, you know, look at setbacks differently. Just there's, you have to have something that's going to help the audience and then be able to deliver it in a compelling fashion. So I always say, go to Speakers Bureau's website, find speakers that you're, have a similar topic to what you want to talk about. Look at their videos because the number one barrier to entry is video. So no matter what you've done, no matter what you've achieved, I don't care how many Olympic medals, how many Nobel prizes, how many puppies you've rescued from burning buildings. If you don't have good video, no one's gonna pay you to speak because they want to see what they're buying. They wanna see what they're buying. So you have to have good video. And it's gotta be on a stage in front of an audience with good camera work and good audio. It can't be at a dinner meeting when there's waiters walking across the frame and plates <laughs> clanking. You've gotta have good video on stage. So that's the most important thing is having good, once you have the content and the delivery, you have to have video. You cannot get paid to work as a speaker with any um, consistency unless you have video. Um, so number two, preparing to climb if you've had, oh, this is a tough one because you always wanna protect whatever injury you've had to prevent further injury, right? Or worsening it. So, I mean, I would say get a doctor's, get a doctor, like a medical opinion before you go climb a big mountain if you have some kind of injury that you're worried about because you don't want to make it worse and you don't want to have something go wrong on a mountain. On I, When I was climbing Mount Elbrus in Russia, two people around me, two people broke their legs Ooh. within 20 minutes of each other. One guy snapped his ankle and as we, we made a stretcher out of our Gore-Tex jackets and trekking poles, we literally MacGyvered a stretcher 
And as we're carrying him down in a stretcher, one of the guys carrying the stretchers fell and he actually didn't break his leg. That's right. He dislocated his knee. So now we had to make another stretcher. So, uh, Mountains can be really scary places if you have injuries. So you want to make sure you get a doctor's clearance before you try anything. So Allison, before you go, yeah. life has changed. There's a different normal. You'd yeah. generally be on the road. You would be doing three, sometimes four speeches a week. It yeah, was sometimes more, sometimes six or seven a week. It was crazy. crazy. It's crazy. And you would receive a majority of your income from speaking. All of it, 100%. What's the yeah. new normal for you and how have you taken so, advantage of this? So first of all, obviously it's a bummer to not be able to go out and be able to do live speeches. So my income right now is gone, but I just feel like there's so many people right now that have challenges and are struggling. And I, if I, I feel like maybe I have some expertise or advice that could help people. So I don't want to sit on the sidelines if I have expertise that could help people right now. So that's why I love doing stuff like this because it helps me like I feel useful and I feel like I'm connecting with new people and making new friends and new connections. So that's always good. But I don't know, you know, I don't know what the future is going to look like for me, but I think it's okay. I don't think we have to know what next year is going to look like or next month or next week or even tomorrow. Like it's okay that I don't know what the future looks like. I just know I have the ability to adapt and figure it out and you know, I know I'm going to be fine. So I am doing some virtual speeches, which has been fun. A lot of the, a lot of the speeches that canceled their in-person went to virtual. So luckily I can still earn some money doing virtual speeches. Have they given you a similar type of pay structure or is it dramatically less? So for the people that booked me before COVID-19 that just went to virtual, it's the same pay structure. So, cause they already paid and they- Right, right. Contract. I'm wondering moving but, forward. I will tell you that, so like my normal speaking fee is $32,000. Moving forward um, for domestic, for, they tried to double that for international, believe it or not, but moving forward, I'll tell you that um, we haven't had any new offers come in. Like everything else, like stuff for September, October hasn't canceled yet. So that is still hopefully on the calendar, but for the offers that are coming in for virtual, um, like they're coming in at like, 30 to 50% of normal fee. Like they're not coming in at full fee because the reality is that people, you know, it's different when you have to get on a plane and you've got to fly to Boston on Monday and You're right. on Tuesday and Orlando Wednesday and Hawaii Thursday and London on Saturday. Like, and you're just doing this and you're never home and you're gone for three weeks at a time. You're on a plane every day. That's wear and tear and you're away from home. And, but people know when you are at home and you're going to go just like have dinner with your husband and your dogs as soon as you're done, they're like, why should we pay all this money when, and I could argue, well, it's the same IP. It's the same, you know, and I've got to be the AV person and the speaker. The reality is that it's not a hardship. Like once you get the AV down, it's not a hardship for me to sit here because I'm not away from my family and, no, it's awesome. So, it's actually great. If you can do even half of what you did where you could stay home, it's a pretty yeah. damn good life. Yeah. And, and the other thing is before I couldn't do free speeches because I literally had no time. Yeah. And if I would say yes to a free speech, it could have been my one day that I was going to come home in between a 12 day trip and a 17 day trip. So now I'm gone for 40 days because I agreed to do a free speech. So I couldn't do free speeches. I know, I know it sounds weird to say like, I'm really excited that I can do stuff for free, but I'm really excited that I can do stuff for free. Because well, there you go. Look at the one that was just posted. Come and speak to the LA fire department. Yes. So That's there's a lot of groups I would love. I really want to support and really want to speak for that I couldn't before. And now like this, I can. So I just you know? want to let you know, this is a men's group and you're the only woman we would even allow to be part of our group. I'm just saying, okay. Yeah. Hey. Guys, what do you think? I'm like an honorary member. I appreciate oh, yeah. that. Yeah, I think you're pretty damn badass, right? Uh, Allison, I love you, and I think you're incredible. You. And I'm honored to have you hang out with us. And everyone, unmute yourself, and let's all thank Allison Levine for hanging out with us. Come on, everyone, you guys, unmute. Thank you. Thank you so Come much. Down, for man, time Allison. Time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank I'll, you. Try to, uh, thank you. I'll try to answer these questions. I feel like, I don't know. Are you good? How do I do this? Well, guys, no, first you of all, all, feel free. You can reach out to me on 